Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on racial disparities in living donation. This webinar is co-sponsored by the AST Transplant Pharmacy and Living Donor COPs and supported by the AST Ideal Committee. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the COP hubs next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A section in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we don't have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the COB hubs following the webinar. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current, current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to one of our moderators, Dr. Ankita Patel, Transplant Nephrologist and Associate Program Director of the Transplant Nephrology Fellowship at the Mount Sinai Hospital to begin our presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of ASD's Transplant Pharmacy COP and the LDCOP, I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining us. Um, racial disparities in living donor transplantation are well recognized. And with this webinar, we hope to shed light on uh, existing disparities with a focus on potential solutions towards mitigating them. Um, we have a lineup of three exciting talks. Um, our speakers are Dr. Lashara Davis, Dr. David Tabor, and Dr. Juan Quesito. Um, the following are their conflicts of interest. Um, our first speaker uh, I would go ahead and introduce without further ado is Dr. Lashara Davis. She is an assistant professor of uh, population health sciences and surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College and outcomes research and surgery at the Houston Methodist Hospital in patient engagement, diversity, and education. In her current role, she focuses on community-based particip participatory research design, patient engagement, and patient-centered education development. She's committed to research on patient-centered care, health message, and education development, and reducing racial and ethnic health disparities through communication. We're delighted to have you, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for a wonderful introduction, and welcome everyone who's joining us today to learn a little bit more or engage a little bit more in living donor uh, transplant disparities. Uh, for my portion today, I'm going to really do just a general overview of racial disparities in living donor transplant and then finish up with some suggestions for ways in which we might be able to uh, reduce some of those disparities. Uh, my colleagues who will be presenting after me offer specific examples of some uh, wonderful interventions that are either in progress, have been completed, or are uh, on the horizon. So I'm excited to be the first one to kind of launch things uh, for this wonderful presentation for today. So today, as I mentioned, I'll provide an overview of disparities in living donation with a focus on race. I wanted to start off to kind of just give um, a reflection on what's been happening with regard to access to transplant over the last two decades. According to a 2020 Jesse Schold article, uh, we really haven't been able to advance access to transplant despite all of the interventions, despite all of the um, major strategies that we've been trying to incorporate or, or, or utilize to, to make changes or to see change, we haven't seen significant uh, changes, specifically rate list, rate, rates of waitlisting uh, in transplantation did not improve and had even worsened among the most vulnerable populations, despite what we've been doing in terms of increasing awareness, in terms of policy reform, and in terms of the research that we are, we are involved in. Access to living donation between 1995 and 2014. Uh, you can see here that there's an association between race and ethnicity with living donor kidney transplant. Um, and what we found here, uh, this is an article by Dr. Purnell, 
um, and colleagues, there's an ongoing increase in disparities in living donor kidney transplantation that suggests that we need to do something on a national level to address these disparities. Disparities in transplant um, are uh, exhibited in a few different ways. Uh, low income, racial and ethnic minorities are often significantly less likely to be waitlisted. So from the start of the process, low income patients, um, patients without private insurance and patients with pre-ESKD nephrology care without rather pre-ESKD nephrology care are less likely to take steps towards kidney transplant. Um, low income patients are at higher risk of failing to complete necessary evaluation and treatment regimens. And this indicates that they may require additional education support to reinforce adherence to these strategies. We can also look at some of the predictors of having a living donor transplant and what we find factors associated with lower probability include black race, older age, lower income, having public insurance, more comor comorbidities, uh, transplantation pre-change to the allocation, the new kidney allocation system, uh, those who have a higher level of religiosity, which is surprising, um, less social support, less transplant knowledge and fewer learning activities. So we can see here that there are certain demographic and social factors that uh, will predict the likelihood of receiving a transplant with those who are from racial and ethnic minority, minority groups being less likely to do so. We can also see that there is some association between sociocultural cultural factors with the initiation of kidney transplant. Um, some things such as medical mistrust, uh, patient perceived racism and discrimination and referral for transplant evaluation often deter minorities from starting or continuing evaluation. Now, there are some recommendations that can help to eliminate these barriers, barriers and may include provider participation in interventions to reduce implicit bias. Uh, staff education or disparities on staff education um, disparities that the, on the disparities that minorities face and early exposure to education for patients to establish trust between them and their care team. So really working more collaboratively with patients, addressing their needs, addressing these factors that are beyond, um, that sometimes are often beyond their control, uh, but incorporating these into the care, showing that as a system, as a provider, we do care about these other, other factors so that we can do a better job at, at uh, addressing their needs. So to attain and address uh, inequities in, um, in transplant, we want to try strategies such as providing education in multiple languages. When you have access to resources that uh, address your needs in a language that you understand and a language that you feel comfortable with, that helps to reduce some of the barriers that people face. Also providing support for overcoming some of the socioeconomic challenges to living donor kidney transplant. And we know that there have been uh, recent legislation that helps uh, definitely help to address some of these barriers. Implementing culturally tailored or community-based uh, education at each point of the transplant process. Uh, we need to look at the evaluation process and how we can better um, engage patients through the evaluation process through the waitlisting process, through the actual transplant and donation process, we need to look at different strategies that we can implement to help patients through these processes. Also, we can engage a transplant liaison or even a patient navigator to help work one-on-one -on -one with communities um, and dialysis uh, clinics in order to help patients as they're trying to navigate the process, as they're trying to work through the process so that they feel support, supported throughout. We can also utilize living donor champions or people who are outside of the donor themselves to, uh, or the patient themselves to help educate patients and their social network about transplant, about living kidney donation. Um, and it takes the burden oftentimes off of the patient in doing that type of education. Another strategy is to amplify patient and donor voices so that they can share real life living donation stories and empower each other. We found in some of the research that we do by providing an outlet or a space uh, for patients to share, patients and donors to share their experiences with living donor transplant. Uh, they found it really useful. They see it as a way to uh, engender support uh, within their community or to offer support or to give back to others um, since they've received such, the, the, such a wonderful gift in receiving a transplant. 
Now, as I mentioned, the presentations that follow do a little bit more of digging deeper, do a deeper dive rather in terms of uh, some of these specific strategies. And so you get to see how these actually play out. Here I outline some ideas or some suggestions that can be implemented and my colleagues will do a wonderful job of describing those a bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for laying a strong foundation for this topic. Um, my name is Idris Yakub. I'm a transplant pharmacist at Virginia Commonwealth University Health System. And it is my honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Tabor. Uh, Dr. David Tabor is a professor in the Division of Transplant Surgery at the Medical, Medical University of South Carolina and a clinical pharmacy specialist at the Ralph Johnson VA Medical Center in Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Tabor has been working as a clinical pharmacy specialist for more than 20 years, providing medication therapy management for transplant patients with complex chronic health conditions. He spends most of his time now dedicated to health services research. Dr. Tabor is the director of the Surgical Outcomes Research and Innovation Nucleus, or SORIN, which has more than 60 ongoing clinical trials across all surgical disciplines. SORIN actively follows nearly 600 patients enrolled in clinical trials. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Tabor, for doing this talk. Thanks, Idris, and, and thank you for the um, organizers uh, for inviting me to present. I'm going to be talking about potential technology solutions to address racial disparities and access to living donation. Um, I do want to, um, before I get going, want to mention that I'm really, my most of my research has focused on technology solutions related to the post-transplant care of patients, but I think a lot of these do translate to the pre side um, and, and are focused on disparities. And, and again, that's been um, an area of emphasis for me as well. So here's my general outline. First, I'll just really touch on the burden of disparities in kidney transplant. I think uh, Dr. Davis did a nice job setting the table and I'm not gonna uh, repeat any of her stuff, but, but simply to focus on the, some of the potential causes and mediators of disparities in kidney transplant and living donor access and how some of the technologies we have at our fingertips or that are being developed or uh, potentially being studied can help uh, uh, mitigate some of these issues. So this was a study by uh, Christine Lentine and colleagues that uh, was published in 2018 and really just demonstrates what we all know that uh, disparities in living donor kidney transplantation are, are problematic and, and continue to worsen. So between 1995 and 2014, you can see there was actually an increase in living donor kidney transplant rates within white candidates while there was a, a, a plateauing or a decrease in Black transplant recipients. And this is also uh, potentially problematic in, in other minority groups. Um, and Dr. Casado will talk about Hispanic populations uh, for the next presentation. Uh, the authors went on to discuss some of the potential barriers and solutions to this issue. So on the left side are, are five potential barriers they identified including educational barriers, misunderstanding and mistrust, as Dr. Davis mentioned, uh, financial disincentives. Some of these we're trying to work through uh, through uh, through legislation and policy, but other the, some of these are at the patient level or at the community level. And then the fact that there's a correlation between uh, race, particularly African-American race, and certain medical comorbidities that may preclude donation. And, and we all are familiar with the higher uh, prevalence of diabetes and hypertension in our African-American communities, particularly those in the Southeastern United States. On the right hand of this slide depicts some of the potential solutions. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus these solutions onto how technologies can help mitigate some of these barriers. So obviously improving education through culturally tailored interventions, um, mitigating financial disincentives uh, at the patient level or community level. I'll talk about how, how some technologies can help with that. Improving donor risk assessment. And again, um, how technology can help uh, efficiencies and logistics within that. And then the, uh, at the end, I will briefly cover the, the role of social media and other technology platforms to uh, help identify potential living donors as we know the disparities um, that are related to that. So let's start with um, why technology. 
So most of us have probably heard of the digital divide, but essentially that is um, a, a chasm between the ability to access and utilize available technologies across various socioeconomic statuses and racial minorities. Um, and we typically think of the digital divide, at least in mainstream media, related to education access. So, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, everyone had to pivot to home-based education. And uh, some of the uh, digital divide issues related to broadband internet access and smartphone technologies and, and, and these sorts of things was really highlighted uh, during COVID-19. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, though, is the digital divide is primarily thought of in relation to broadband internet access and computer technologies. And in fact, mobile health technologies may actually be bridging this divide. So on the right hand of this slide, you see the Health Information National Trends Survey, which is done periodically as a cross-sectional survey. And this data outlines the longitudinal results of these surveys from 2008 to 2017. And what this um, survey is asking in particular for this question is having internet access via a cell phone or mobile smartphone technology. And what's become more clear over the past couple uh, cycles of this survey is that non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics have increased um, access and utilization of internet via smartphone and mobile health, uh, mobile phone technology. So this potentially is bridging the digital divide related to internet broadband access. And we could potentially leverage this technology to help us address disparities in living donor access. The other nice thing about smartphone penetrance is it's ubiquitous. So this is data on the left from, um, from national data from uh, the e-marketer system, but, but this data is, is uh, available through various um, surveys. And what it shows is about three quarters of the US population now has a smartphone, um, regardless of race, age, and sex. Um, and this is on the right hand side is this data from MUSC. We've done this survey twice. It's a little bit dated, but it does in fact mirror the US population. So we know our transplant patients also have access to this technology. And what's also nice is they're very willing to use it for mobile health applications. So this is a question we also asked patients uh, in that previous survey, how likely were they to use it if, if someone helped them set it up and it was free? And 80% said they were agreed or strongly agreed to using it. And this data is uh, consistent across various survey domains um, regarding using mobile health technologies. So we know it potentially bridges the, um, the digital divide, it's ubiquitous, and it's uh, very um, uh, patients are willing, very willing to use smartphone technology. So in that regard, it's it's potentially very promising for us. So let's jump into some of the potential aids out there. Um, the first one I want to briefly cover is Vanderbilt, and they've been on the forefront of using technologies for access to transplant. So it's it's not surprising they've already developed the transplant app in this regard. And I downloaded two screenshots of this app on the right. Um, this is a, a mobile phone-based application. Um, some forms on it, frankly, seem that they were developed native to smartphone and others seem that they're web-based that were brought in. Um, and, and again, I think native development of these forms within, this, within the mobile health and smartphone application make them much more user-friendly, such as the form on the right versus the form on the left. But none, Nonetheless, this application actually allows patients to click links uh, related to learning more about kit living kidney donation, um, where their clinics are located. They actually have a nice map feature on the bottom, um, as well as a directory. And then uh, for providers to actually, um, uh, for referrals, they can actually directly communicate through this application. So. Um, it's available free on the uh, on the App Store, iOS, or Android. I downloaded it on my phone, and these are screenshots of it here. Hopkins also has developed, Johns Hopkins University and Dr. Henderson, uh, Macy Henderson, who's done a lot of work in this area, has developed uh, what's called mKidney, which is a, a novel mobile health platform that's actually developed for both uh, post-donation care, so not 
necessarily in, increasing access, but certainly increasing efficiencies along the uh, transitions of care. I was a, uh, unable to actually access this system, but I highlighted on the right what, what the key features of this um, smartphone app were, which include a HIPAA compliant patient-facing patient uh, provider-facing portal, simple user interface with answering required clinic survey questions and review response. So again, engaging our follow-ups and, and text messaging as well. Um, we developed a mobile health app at MUSC, which we tested in a randomized controlled trial. Again, this was for post-transplant care, but I bring it up at, at this webinar because I think a lot of its features actually could be used uh, in the pre-transplant assessment and uh, access for living donation. So this is a screenshot of the app. Um, and I want to uh, just go over a couple of key features of it that I think may be applicable to living donor access. So we were able um, through the app to Bluetooth link to blood pressure monitoring. So for instance, if we're trying to um, determine living donor um, potential viability, we can actually do home-based remote patient monitoring through an app such as this. Um, and we can get all their readings either in tabular form or in uh, graphical form and download this data and then actually upload it into the EMR currently manually, but certainly there are options to, to um, develop APIs to push this right into the EHR and allow for uh, more objective assessment of potential living donors. Um, we can also do this with blood glucose, because obviously diabetes wouldn't necessarily be uh, an indication for donation, but if we're worried about prediabetes, or uh, insulin resistance, um, this is a feature that may, may allow us to better uh, understanding our, our uh, potential donor and their risks. Um, another feature that we could potentially uh, use in access is, um, is sorry, this is, uh, I wanna jump through this and get to the side effects survey. So this app allows us to push surveys directly to the patient. In this case, it was for side effects, but we could push any type of survey. Um, any type of PRO, any type of information we want and get those data back to us real time. And again, um, either upload it manually into the EHR or develop an API to, to automate that process. And this is just a screenshot of the survey itself here. Um, and then this is just a portal we developed, a web-based portal that interfaces between uh, data from the EHR, which is highlighted in blue, in this case, to Crolimus levels. Um, and appointment adherence, mobile health data that I just showed you, the blood pressures and glucoses, as well as um, self-reported adherence um, and the symptom score from that survey, and then administrative data, which includes refill adherence. Again, not necessarily totally applicable to the living donor access, but, but components of this certainly could help inform um, decisions regarding potential living donors in a very efficient manner where patients aren't having to come back to the center multiple times. A lot of this can be done remotely uh, through RPM and virtual visits, as well as uh, uh, engagement using mobile-based technologies. And then we are actually able to, to text the patients directly through this portal as well. <clears throat> so we tested this in a clinical trial. I'm not going to go through it, but the bottom line is we reduced hospitalization significantly. We had improved uh, renal function. So, um, and it really, we had some survey data uh, suggesting that patients really uh, were fully engaged in the app and the app was durably used for a full year after, uh, um, after initial randomization. So just more data that, that patients are willing to use this technology, stay engaged with it and, and use it to help with health outcomes. <clears throat> so how can we apply this to living donation? Well, I mentioned some of this as I was going through it, but we certainly can use apps to enhance communication, to provide education as the, as the Vanderbilt app does, and engage patients directly through text communication or indirectly through RPM, as is mentioned in the second bullet. And then we can also uh, use smartphone-based uh, Systems, as I mentioned, help bridge the digital divide related to um, limited access to broadband internet. Moving on to web-based systems, this is probably where most of the development has done historically, and certainly there uh, are great resources out there uh, to help with access to kidney, a living donor kidney transplant. So the first one I'll mention is actually published in 2012, a decade ago. It's kind of scary to think 
this um, this system was tested a decade ago. I remember when this paper came out, but this is again a Vanderbilt system that used a web-based application to help screen for living donors, and they published the results, the, the references there on the bottom, but basically they showed the, um, that 801 candidates completed the web-based survey compared to a phone survey, and that uh, it, it improved accessibility on white uh, nights and weekends, and they had a higher number of self-referrals. It's unclear if this actually led to more potential living donors that, that underwent um, transplantation, but nonetheless, um, really promising data for, from a web-based application. Um, as most on the call are probably very familiar, the living donor COP has put a lot of uh, spearheaded a really nice toolkit, and there's a screenshot of it. The website is on the bottom, open to um, anyone, AST members or the public alike. And this toolkit has tremendous resources available to help with potential living donor access. And I just highlight two here. So there's a living donor financial toolkit and a living donor uh, medical toolkit. There's also one for living liver donor as well, which I'm not highlighting here. And I just screenshot one potential um, tool component of this toolkit regarding the financial toolkit, and that's a workshop here, workshop form here. But there's uh, tremendous resources. I, I recommend everyone peruse it um, at, at your leisure because I think you'll find the information um, really helpful if, if you're working in living donor uh, access. Um, Emory has also spearheaded some great work. Um, led by Rachel Patzer and her team at Emory, as well as the Southeastern Kidney Coalition. This is um, um, an actual uh, DVD and booklet that they've converted to a web-based platform. Again, this is publicly available at um, the site. I'm not sure if I have it up, but it, the name of the site is, um, is uh, ACT Now, but it's projectlivingacts.org. And it's uh, five videos. You can see them up there. Um, introduction in the living donor process, benefits and risks, the kidney transplant process, identifying potential living donors, and then acting on that. It's um, really geared at African Americans, and that's what this study is that I, that is outlined on this page here. They're doing a foresight randomized controlled trial to see if it actually increases the number of living donor inquiries. They're randomizing sites to either use this web-based platform or just a uh, standard healthy living, um, ha healthy eating platform. So it'll be interesting to see these results when they are in fact published. But I did peruse all the videos, the, the five videos, they, they range in um, length from two to eight minutes. Some great resources, great information, very high production level, again, publicly available. Um, I'm so happy they've made this publicly available even before they've fully tested the, the, the system, but they've already developed the DVD and booklet, so um, which was, was which was validated. So the system is 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 quite um, useful in that regard. <clears throat> and then um, not to steal any of Dr. Caseda's uh, thunder, but I do want to mention he's done tremendous work in the uh, Hispanic arena and culturally competent uh, competence with related to um, uh, Latinos and Hispanics uh, with uh, with uh, this website, informado.org. Informade.org is, is, as you can see, it's a Spanish-based system to help, um, help uh, educate on access to living donor kidney for those of uh, speaking Spanish or reading Spanish. So again, another great resource out there. Um, pivoting just a little to other potential technologies, I want to cover uh, virtual visits, telehealth, community embedded resources very uh, briefly, and certainly open to any questions or comments about this at the end. So we've all been doing virtual visits. Most of us have been involved in that since COVID. Um, they've been really quintessential in helping us uh, provide distant care to our patients during this pandemic, but, but, um, but the platforms are essentially pretty much available across most systems and EHR. Uh, we use DoxyMe here, but, but there's various other ones. This is a paper we published um, just last year that, that actually assessed our use of virtual visits to help maintain equity and access during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we showed is um, through this triaging system, either green, yellow, or red, 
green are fast track patients, yellow are, are uh, potential, and then red are, are likely to be halted. We use virtual um, visits all along these cascades to really improve the efficiency so we weren't bringing patients in unnecessarily to the hospital for eval. So the fast pack track patients, if they were being listed from another center, so dual listed or all they needed was an echo or stress echo, we could do a virtual visit and then list them in and of itself without a face-to-face -face visit. The yellow visits, uh, yellow patients, which are that middle group, we uh, initially screened with the nephrologist through a virtual visit and then moved it on to the surgeon in clinic if they were deemed appropriate. And then the red patients were, were likely to be halted prior to actually them being um, fully evaled. We did virtual visits to accommodate that as well. So again, just another example of how potential virtual visits can really improve efficiencies in how we screen uh, potential transplant recipients, but also in this case, uh, donors. And then one, um, one other thing I wanna mention is a program called Help Finder. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's, uh, it's a free community-based resource, helpfinder.ampertha.com. Used to be named Ampertha, but basically you put in the patient zip code and then you click a link on here. If they're needing resources such as food or housing or transit, I know uh, logistical issues and getting transportation to the center for evaluation is a huge logistical challenge. Um, particularly in communities that have reduced resources that are, that are pretty distant to the transplant center. And this may be a potential uh, benefit. If you click those links, it'll come up with, um, this is Charleston, for example, different potential community resources and, and then have actual links directly to apply for that support. Um, so social workers or other financial counselors or potential patient navigators can help um, can help patients or potential living donors utilize this system to get access to resources in their community to overcome some of the barriers we know, potentially logistic or financial barriers that are precluding um, donation. And then uh, one thing that comes up is what about patients without technology access? Well, I think it's important that we use community-based resources to help those patients. So this is a study um, that we did at MUSC uh, in collaboration with, uh, with um, Jim Rodriguez uh, in, in, um, up in Boston. And basically we developed a video-based um, intervention that was delivered in the dialysis center to help patients uh, regarding education and understanding the transplant process. So this is just an example. We actually reduced um, disparities related to education and distance to the center with this intervention to deliver directly via uh, iPads at the dialysis site and uh, significantly increase patient self-efficacy and uh, um, actually the number of referrals increased as well as the evals that were initiated from this intervention. And then finally, just um, lastly, I'll briefly mention the use of social media. So one of the major barriers to improving access to living donor kidney transplant, particularly in African-Americans, is the fact that, um, that there are certain diseases that correlate with, uh, with African-Americans, particularly in the Southeast, that may preclude them from being potential donors, such as diabetes and hypertension. And because of that, we may actually have to help identify more potential living donors to, to get a hit and actually move through the full process and, and have them being um, uh, actual donors. And so it may be helpful to use some of these technologies to help identify potential living donors. So this was a really nice review done by Macy Henderson. Again, she's done some great work in this area out of Hopkins that reviews all the potential social media and other platforms, uh, web-based and smartphone-based to help identify uh, potential living donors. And there's a really nice table in this uh, review, which I recommend you go through, which outlines the different potential social medias, what uh, types and platforms, what they are, and then examples. So we're all probably familiar with Facebook or LinkedIn, which are our typical social networking sites. We've all heard anecdotal stories of patients identifying donors, um, living donors through just, just posting their story on, on these social media platforms. 
But there's also some a growing interest in these other platforms such as Twitter, um, Tumblr, but actually, sorry, not Tumblr, Twitter, um, but, but, but two that aren't mentioned here that are really commonly used now are Snapchat and our TikTok, which you can post the videos, which are, are really compelling, short vignettes about your case, and you can share them either publicly or with friends and help get the word out that you're looking for a potential living donor. I think if you, you know, if you work with your patients to actually put that information out there um, through some of these platforms, you're, you, you, you have the strong potential of identifying um, additional potential donors for those patients. So just to summarize and conclude, and again, I, I had to fly through those, but hopefully we have time at the end to answer any questions or discuss any other platforms that may have um, not covered, but we know racial disparities in access to kidney transplant and particularly living donor kidney transplant for African Americans and other minorities continues to plague the transplant community. The trends are unfortunately in the wrong direction. And uh, hopefully I was able to share with you some information that uh, technology potentially offers the, uh, a nice avenue to help address this issue, help um, particularly with smartphones and, and bridge the digital divide. We know smartphones are ubiquitous now and they're more commonly used by minority populations to access the internet. We can certainly leverage this to help us identify potential living donors and then um, help understand and utilize uh, technologies that are already embedded in our day-to-day -day lives to help leverage those um, for potentially addressing access disparities. And I showed you just you know, some examples of web-based resources and social networks. Um, so thank you for your time and I look forward to the discussion at the end. Thank you, Dave, Dr. Tabor, for the great talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Caicedo. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Juan Caicedo. He is a professor of surgery and a multi-organ adult and pediatric transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and Lurie Children's Hospital. He's the surgical director of the Northwestern Liver Transplant Program, hepatobiliary surgery, and the director of their Living Donor Liver Transplant Program. He's also the director and founder of the Hispanic Transplant Program at Northwestern Medicine. It was launched in 2006, and it is a first of its kind program in the country that offers culturally competent and congruent care for Hispanic transplant patients and their families. Uh, he is the recipient of several recognitions and awards. Uh, he was named one of top 40 under 40, according to Crane's Chicago Business. He is a recipient of the Gift of Life Award from NKF Foundation of Illinois. He is the inaugural chair of the ASTS Minority Issues Committee and the past co-chair of the Ideal Task Force of AST. Um, Dr. Casido, I hand it over to you. Welcome, thank you. Dr. Patel, thank you very much um, for that kind introduction. I just want to make sure that the slides, you can see it now. Um, they're actually not in full screen. Would you um, mind? You might just need to um, exit out and reshare. Okay, let me reshare. Perfect. Now it's a full screen? Yes, yes, we see it full screen now. Thank you. Okay, great. Then in, thank you very much, Dr. Patel, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And then in the third uh, uh, kind of short talk, we're going to be addressing racial disparity for living donation through a culturally and linguistically transplant program. My objective is to describe institutional specific practice changes that have identified and addressed racial disparity for living donation, describe outcomes of the Northwestern Medicine Hispanic Transplant Program, and describe program and financial outcomes of the implementation of the Northwestern Medicine Hispanic transplant program and other transplant program across the country. Then first of all, very quickly, just to mention some uh, facts about the Hispanic Americans in US, we're the largest minority in US. We are more than 60 million, close to 20% of the population. Uh, we have the fastest growth in America. The Hispanics account for more than half of the nation's growth in the last decade. And this is very important cultural fact. We have a very young community, the Minaceous theory. And when we're talking about transplantation, it's relevant. Then this is just to show 
how re relevant is the growth of these community. Then from all Hispanics, 62% are Hispanics and depends on the area of you are working, then the proportion can change. And another important cultural fact is how big is the, the uh, families in this community. Hispanic has big families. A lot of people will consider that a, 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 an issue, but when we're talking about transplantation as a huge advantage that most of the transplant centers are not taken in consideration. And in general, as is well known, minorities receive fewer kidneys from living donors than whites. Um, out of all whites receiving a living donors, uh, here you can see 42% were, uh, uh, I'm sorry, out of all whites receiving a kidney transplant, 42% were receiving a living donors, and Hispanics is only 24. Um, some facts about Hispanic American kidney transplantation is well known that it has a, the highest growth in the kidney transplant waiting list, and is 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 is, is uh, easy to understand because they have the fastest growth as a population, and they have a high prevalence of uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and that are the leading causes of renal failure too. They have one of the longest waiting list time, and they have a high mortality on the waiting list. But as soon as you transplant them. They, they have the, the same or better outcomes compared with white, that is the Hispanic paradox. And there's a great need for uh, transplantation and living donation, but they have lower donation rate. There's multiple barriers for patients and potential living donors, including language, in, uh, including difference in dialect. Um, there's cultural difference between patients and providers. There's distrust of providers uh, and there's distrust of the patients too. There's lack of community awareness. There's misconception of organ donation and transplantation that needs, needs to be dispelled and to clarify. And there is barriers uh, that impair access to preventive care, health education and some treatment options. Then it's interesting, we did a study where we did a national survey and we're interested to see how most of the transplant center were providing education. And what's interesting to see that most of the centers in the, in the right column, most of the center were doing education in English. They were relying on written material. They were doing a one-on-one -on -one discussion and the education is given by no physicians and the center rely upon interpreters. But then we did another study where we're assessing the Hispanic preferences and was clear for Hispanic, they told us that they would prefer to receive the education in Spanish. And it's important to remember that 75% of the Hispanics will speak at Spanish at home. And they will prefer a face-to-face -face inter, inter, interaction instead of written material. And they will prefer a group discussion instead of one-on-one. -on -one. The best way to scare people is when we're sitting one-on-one -on -one and trying to explain all the risks and benefit, all the potential complications. People are scared when they're coming to our pre-transplant evaluations. And, but when you have a group that create a, a, a more a, or a better environment for them to learn, even if they can learn because they are over, overwhelmed, maybe the other family members or friends can help them to understand afterwards. And they really prefer the educator to be a physician. When we're talking about education, we know that it's not only one time event. And I think it's important to have the social workers, the, the nurses, the PAs, everyone providing education. But the physician, we should provide education. And most of the physicians in the US don't provide education because they feel they're so busy and they shouldn't spend time doing that. But actually in the Hispanic community, the physician has an uh, authority, they, they have authority figure on them. MD in Spanish means medio Dios, translated to English as half God. They really respect the physician and the priest and they were rather to receive the education from physician. And then you can develop the, the relation with the patient and they, they will love that and they will follow you easier. And they really, they prefer bilingual, bicultural educators. Now, the question is if we are responsive to the needs of the transplant population that we're serving in US. Actually, we did a very simple study looking at 
all the kidney transplant centers website. And we can argue that maybe the information there is not the more updated, and maybe there's misrepresentation, or, or know everybody publish everything it is doing, but at least give us a sense. Then what's interesting, even though 64% of the patients waiting for a kidney transplant in the US right now are non-white, and there's a lot of minorities there, and is speaking different languages, only, and we, we measure this in two time points in 2013 and 2018, it's interesting to see that only 10% of the kidney transplant program in the US has a website translated different language besides English. And, and it's more concerning that despite the fact that most of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity in, 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 on the waiting list, only 4% of the kidney transplant program has a culturally targeted initiatives. Here, we're not measuring a high quality uh, culturally targeted initiative. We're looking for anything, including a bad translator uh, education. And, and the other question that some people ask themselves if they, there's enough diversity in our transplant programs, right? Um, and then it's just to emphasize, we're looking here if there was at least one a physician or team member, surgeon or nephrologist that, that were part of other ethnic and racial groups, then basically 21% of the center has at least one African-American and then Hispanics, 35% uh, of the centers has at least one Hispanic uh, nephrologist, transplant nephrologist or so kidney transplant surgeon. And in these centers, 77% of those centers has at least somebody that speaks a different languages. And specifically about Hispanics, almost 40% of the center has at least one bilingual uh, uh, physician. And when we analyze the top 100 uh, kidney transplant programs in the nation that actually perform 85% of the transplants and actually 80% of the transplant in Hispanics and African-Americans, 50% of those center has at least one bilingual a transplant surgeon or transplant nephrologist. And then the question is why we don't have more uh, culturally targeted initiatives in the, in the nation. There's enough uh, workforce that are available to implement these programs. Um, now, when we talk about the living kidney and liver donation decision-making process, there's three key elements that needs to be considered. First of all, in this community, you have to consider the decision makers. In the Hispanic community, as well in the Asian community, for example, are the elders, grandma, la abuelita. When you're getting married, you're dying, or you're getting a transplant, usually you want to talk with grandma and then to have the blessing for her, uh, or the elders. Then basically you have to convince our, our grandma about the benefit of transplantation, about the benefit of living donation, or the rents and benefit and everything. And then many times, and also we, we talk to them and let them know how most of the religions are in favor of organ donation. Hispanics are in general uh, Christians or Catholics in 90, 95%. And then we talk as how the Pope, John Paul II used to say that this, Don, uh, to donate an organ is one of the biggest acts of love that anybody can do, how the, uh, the Pope Francis in favor of donation. And again, most of the religion are in favor of donation. And then usually grandma opened their eyes and they, they offer even to be a living donor. And actually that is not our goal. All the grandmas or grandpas have donated uh, kidneys, for example. Our goal is to have their blessing. To address the second key element in the decision-making process about living donation is the family and support network. Here is the young people. Then to our clinic, actually we bring the whole family, the decision-makers are the young people. Why? Because we need to address the misconception that they have about organ donation and transplantation. The young Hispanic females, they're concerned about if they can have babies, or they can become pregnant. If it's a young Hispanic male, they're worried about their sexual performance after the donation, if they can work, if they can exercise, they can. They have to take medication forever, or if they have any type of limitation about food. And then as soon as you clarify all of that and they have the blessings of, of the elders, then they will say, well, maybe we should consider to do that. And then we have to address the, 
the third key element in the decision-making process, the patient. Sometimes the patient is the one that doesn't want to consider any potential living donor because they don't want to harm the loved one. Then it's very important to have the three key elements at the same time in the same place to be able to deal with the specific problem. And as soon as you deal with those, it's beautiful to see how more people move forward uh, considering the living donation. When we are talking about the, the, the living donation decision, I think it, this model, the IDA model, I took it from the uh, marketing and it's a funnel. And I think this is what we're doing where we are educating uh, people about organ donation. Then first of all, we have to create awareness is the education. And then that people can develop the interest. And then some of them are going to express the desire is the verbal expression of interest. And then they move to action. Then most of the center just focusing, just keeping track of people that has filled out the health question and the action. But that is the just the tip of the iceberg. We need to focus more the steps before. Then we wrote a, just a recent little paper where we're showing how if patients has available potential living donors that increase the likelihood to access kidney transplantation, particular living donors. Then. And it's essential to track the potential living donor, especially when they are in the desire phase, when they are expressing the verbal, or the, when they have the verbal expression of interest. Most centers just start tracking the information when they are starting the action, but then they, they lose the opportunity to capitalize the potential of reputation. If five people decide or express the interest to donate and only two return the health questionnaire, and you rule them out, at least you know that there's still three more that you can, you know, as the recipient is still interested and they can move forward. Then we start in Northwestern, uh, the Hispanic transplant program as a response to the Hispanic health disparity in transplantation and to meet the need of this growing population in our area. We develop this comprehensive culturally and linguistically competent. That means that we understand the culture and we understand the language, but also we're congruent. We share that culture and language. We started the Hispanic transplant program. That was, our program is the first Hispanic transplant program in the country. We start with the Hispanic kidney transplant program in 2006. And we start with the Hispanic liver transplant program in 2010. Now we have more than 40 bilingual, bicultural staff members. We provide all the, 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 the experience in Spanish. Then now, um, we also target the three key elements of the decision making. We bring the patient, the family decision makers, the elders. We provide everything. The interaction is a face to face interaction, it's in group. And the educators are the physicians, the surgeons and the physician, as well as the rest of the team. And we focus on culture, language, health related, financial concern, preventing Hispanic consider and living donation. And uh, we deal with language barrier, issue related to culture, education, influential role of the extended family, religion, lack of knowledge, fear of donation and surgery, cultural desire to avoid harming the potential donors, resulting in no asking for donation, healthcare professional attitudes, and financial legal concerns. Very quickly, our outcomes, we are able to improve knowledge and attitudes, not only in patients, but also in family members in a significant way. And in our program, we have done more than 6,000 transplant here in Northwestern, we're doing our, around 300 kidney transplants per year. We were able to increase access to transplant care in Hispanics, measured by the addition to the waiting list, 91% in Hispanics. And we increased the number of living donor kidney transplants 74%. This is comparing before and after the implementation of this program. And we were able to decrease the disparity in Hispanics, uh, living donor kidney transplant, we, we compare with a reference group that is known Hispanic whites by 70%. And we were able to increase living donation and the proportion of living donors in a significant way. Every year is different. Our, in, in, in our program, we have, have years of uh, 65 to the highest 78% of our Hispanic receiving a living donor, above uh, whites, above uh, Asians, of African-American. And that can be done. We started the Hispanic liver transplant program and we have done here around 2,400 transplants overall, but specifically in Hispanics, even though it's a small proportion, we're able to improve access to transplant care in, in Hispanics measured 
we were measuring the addition to the waiting list in 54%. We increased the number of living donor liver transplant 88%. Again, this data is not published yet, but it's just to show the trend. Then here by now, in 2022 at Northwestern, we have been able to transplant more than 1,500 Hispanics, more than 1,000 kidney transplant Hispanics. 48% of those are receiving, have received a living donor kidney transplant when in the nation is only 21% in 2021. And we increased the proportion of Hispanics at Northwestern from 9% before implementation in 2005 to 32% currently. And we also we were able to increase the number of liver transplants. Uh, well, we have done more than 300 liver transplants, 10% uh, from living donors. And when in the US is only 4%, uh, we have done more than 80 pancreas transplants. Then very quickly, we implement this program. And that was part of our NIHR01 in other centers across the country. And then it, it's important to, to mention that it's financially feasible to implement this type of cultural and linguistically competent Hispanic kidney transplant program. The cost of implementing is less than 1% of the total organ acquisition cost. And the good news, you can recover, the centers can recover the cost very easily. And then it, it, this is feasible. And there's a huge in, in financial impact when the centers implement the intervention with enough fidelity, they were able to increase in 47% the number of living donor kidney transplant. And again, the total cost was less than 1% of the total cost of the program that can be recovered by the organ acquisition cost or are as well for the uh, uh, excess in revenue that was around 200 to 300%, uh, even if the, if the patient don't have a, Medicare and they have, for example, private insurance. And then the, this type of program financial uh, viable and are financial manageable based on what I mentioned. Then the take home message, the culturally and linguistically competent and congruent transplant programs could increase organ donation and transplantation in Hispanics, decreasing the disparity in living donor organ transplantation. Uh, culturally sensitive transplant co co uh, programs can be disseminated and achieve severe outcomes when are implemented with enough fidelity. And these type of uh, programs also could be financial feasible and manageable. Um, with that, I will conclude and we open for uh, Q&A and thank you very much for, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Drs. Uh, Davis, Tabor and, and Caicedo for an amazing presentation. Uh, at this point, we would like to open it up for questions and, and answers. Um, we really encourage participation uh, by posting your questions in the Q&A section. Um, the first question is uh, for Dr. Davis uh, regarding the, the paper by Dr. Uh, Westerman and colleagues uh, looking at the impact, the factors associated with low probability for kidney transplants. Uh, did they explain what greater uh, religiosity uh, meant in that paper? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, this was based on, on a scale. I don't have it um, offhand, but it was based on a scale and those who scored higher on that religiosity scale we're less likely to have um, to receive a transplant. Thank you. Um, I have the following question. It's actually for Dr. Tabor. Um, so Dr. Tabor, considering the large amount of data available nowadays, specifically clinical data, how do you see machine learning and or AI technologies being used to address or decrease health disparity? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I cheated a little and I saw it early, but I but actually that allowed me to come up with what I think is a at least a somewhat thought out response. So um, it's actually currently so I'll give you its current use and then two potentials. So it's actually currently used in kidney exchange programs. So they use AI or machine learning to help match potential um, exchanges and and create these incredible chains that you've seen on the cover of people and all in all over um you know lay media so there is um actual use right now now two potential areas i see for identifying potential living donors um either altruistically or through your social networks if facebook knows what i'm going to buy on amazon before i do i think we can actually leverage these technologies to help um do more direct um awareness and advertising to to 
to, to people that use these networks that are likely to be either altruistic or directed donors. So I think that's one real untapped potential that I haven't seen used uh, much. The second area, and I think this is actually probably the, the biggest area, is, is helping us make better decisions about potential donors um, regarding the, the gray areas, right? So we, you know, we tend to rule out a lot of donors. We tend to be very conservative. If they have, you know, strong histories of diabetes or hypertension, they're spilling a little protein in their urine, they're pre-diabetic, things like that. Um, we often say no, but we really don't know very well what an, um, what the gold standard is for yes and you know, no. And actually, there's no consistency across transplant centers. So why not use big data, machine learning algorithms, better uh, um, platforms to help us make real evidence-based decisions versus going on, um, you know, very conservative intuition. Thank you, Dr. Tabor. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Caicedo. Uh, what are the attitudes of Hispanics in regards to the Pet Kidney Exchange Program, knowing that their kidneys may not go to, directly to their loved ones? Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you for the question. Then has been, we have a big KPD program here. Then initially we thought that they won't be receptive. And actually one of the main drivers of the KPD actually has been Hispanics because they are willing to donate to somebody else, even if they are compatible. Then always we're consenting our patients for KPD. And even if they are compatible, they are facilitating this change. Then I think the main point is people are ready to give as long as they understand. The problem has been that we have been talking in their culture or using their language, understanding the culture background. And as soon as you do that, people are more willing to do it. And actually they facilitate a lot of these exchanges. Great. Um, uh, the next question is for Dr. Tabor. Uh, do you have any future M Health studies planned to increase living kidney donation in African-American patients? Um, I do not specifically myself. I, I, I'm trying to get uh, a study funded for post-transplant African-American disparities. But, um, the studies I've seen that are active are mainly using web-based platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen much out there regarding um, actually using smartphone-based apps, but I think that's another really untapped area we can we can leverage to help in that regard. And if you know, I'm sure there are folks out there doing these things either formally through research grants or informally through Quapi. And I think it'd be great to share um, either in the chat or just uh, through your local COP um, listservs after the talk. And Dr. Davis, are you aware of any interventions or studies that have achieved similar results as Dr. Quesito's? Uh, well, Dr. Quesito's uh, results are fantastic. Um, just thinking of some interventions that I know have done well or have who, who um, kind of imply that more work in this area needs to be done. Um, I can think of the house calls intervention um, by Dr. Rodriguez. Um, and with that one specifically, one of the things that was, was great about it um, is that they were able to go and engage the community of the patients uh, to have discussions about, uh, about transplant, to have discussions about kidney disease and what it meant for the family. And were able to kind of activate the, the support network around them in order to um, in order to increase the likelihood that these patients would get a kidney transplant. The caveat or hard part about that is it takes a lot of resource to have social workers actually go to homes and do these types of interventions in, in, that, in that space. Um, and this was with a, with a black community. Um, so that's one that I can think of that I know um, has had some good success. Um, however, you know, that one was, was limited in, in being really applied largely because of the, the resources that it would require in order to make that um, sustainable. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Caicedo, does your program partner with local OPOs to raise awareness about don donation or transplants amongst his Hispanics? How did, you, uh, how, did you, how did you get to partner with healthcare system to invest or develop your program? Yeah. 
then thank you for the question. Then yes, I'm actually board member of our OPO and I work in the Hispanic Council. And actually, as soon as we start working with the culturally and linguistically competent initiative in the OPO, we increase the disease donation in, in Hispanics in a significant way. And they have a higher concern rate than even white in some period of time where we're focusing on that. Then I think my point always is possible to change you know, the dynamics that are known in the country when we focus our attention in this type of things. Um, and then in the institution has been a process. Initially, they have been very supportive. I started myself the program, but has been a process to, to convince them that is the right thing to do. And even financially, it's a good thing, you know. Um, and then we have been able to grow, um, making sure that was good for the patient, but good for the institutions. And certainly, uh, you know, uh, I have learned a lot about that and has been very fulfilling. I think I wanted to squeeze in a question of mine uh, while I have the chance. And it was, uh, it's tailored around, you know, to uh, around culturally tailored education. Um, to, to me, when I approach patient education, I feel like all patients have to have a minimum level of understanding, which is sort of universal to everyone about transplant education and should be in a language that they understand. But beyond that, would you like illustrate some of things that somebody like me can incorporate um, into making it a culturally tailored education? Or in other words, how can somebody from a different culture do justice to a culturally tailored approach to our patients? Right. And I think that is a very an essential question. It's not only about to speak the language, right? It's to understand how they see life, how they understand what is going on. How, are, how is the family dynamics, right? Then I will speak about uh, Hispanics because I'm a Hispanic guy. Then I have some insights. And I think the same happened with African-American and Asians. Then the, the point is, for example, we need to uh, understand the, the structure of the family. Is important the family? Yes or not. And if the family is essential, bring the whole family, yeah. right? What they believe, they, 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 their beliefs, their religion is important or not for that specific group. If religion is important, you have to bring it to the table, right? And sexuality is important for this community. Then I address that at front. I talk about sexuality, uh, you know, before, well, after donation, for example, if they can have babies and all the stuff are important for them. If they can work, if they can exercise, the legal issues, right? Some people may think, oh, if I'm undocumented, I can get a, a, a transplant. And actually there is no limitation. UNOS doesn't preclude transplant if you are undocumented, right? But they don't want to even request a, a private insurance because they are afraid that they can be deported. But actually all the private insurance don't have any regulation or any restriction for if patients don't have social security number. Then it's just to understand the specific of our community and come up with a solution for that. Right? Then we have to deal with religion, uh, family, uh, legal, financial, all these things. And then now you have something that is going to be meaningful for that community. Then I would say that everybody should, based on the population that you are serving, trying to do the homework to understand the culture and everything, and then uh, uh, set up your system in the same way. We developed our ATA program with Dr. Simpson, this African-American surgeon here at Northwestern, then it's not the same that Hispanic transfer program. It has a specifics about the African-American culture, but it's following kind of the same pattern. It's to understand the culture, what they're thinking, and try to deal, deal with those. I don't know yes. if you can answer. Yeah. yeah. And, and if I can add, I think it's really important to Dr. Sato's point you know, to really incorporate the, the, the population that you're trying to reach. Um, and not just like in general, we know these things, but actually going and talking to populations, talking to the groups that you're trying to intervene, you're trying to work with, because we, we understand that even within cultures, it's, it's not monolithic, right? There are different, you know, uh, 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 an African-American who's from the Northeast is different from a, an African-American or Black person who's from the, from the Southeast, which is different from the West Coast, which is different from Texas. 
So it, you have to incorporate those types of things as well in order to properly address the community. And then once the education or the information is developed, take it back to the community and see if it's acceptable, see if it addresses the main concerns of the community, see if there's anything that's been left out. Oftentimes, you know, a lot of the work that I do in education design is really speaking to patients and finding out what it is that they want. Uh, we spend so much time, our educated selves, we spend so much time working in groups together to develop education. We're like, yeah, it sounds good. It looks good. This is great. But we don't all the time go back to the community or incorporate the community from the start. That's really the best strategy is to incorporate the community from the start in the design, in the development to make sure that we're addressing their needs and concerns fully in throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I think to to add to that or to to piggyback off of that question, um, I think community nephrologists and uh, primary care providers are extremely integral in this process. And I think a lot of the interventions that we've discussed are targeted towards the patients. How do we get community nephrologists or primary care providers to be involved in the forefront of ident identifying these issues and perhaps equipping them with some resources and how they can intervene early on, even before they get to uh, to the transplant center? Yeah, I can jump in. I think the technologies can aid a lot in, in this. You know, we can provide resources to um, those groups. Um, but but a couple of the examples I provided, it's actually allowing improved access and engagement to the center from those community-based providers. So, you know, the last thing you want to do is is uh, upset a, a community-based provider because they can't get a hold of you or can't access you or don't know where to go if they have a potential donor. So having technology-based solutions can can actually aid like like the Vanderbilt app. It's patient facing, but it's also provider facing. And frankly, I you know, I perused it a bit. I, I think the provider facing component is actually quite quite useful and and clearly native built for the app. So they can refer patients through the app and get 24 seven uh, communication. So I think technology has a real um, benefit there. The, the, you know, the, the other issue is, is shared information and information exchanges, which are still you know, not ready for prime time, but getting better. So we can share you know, whatever tests. Um, you know, so they, the patients go back and they have some type of diagnostic test or, or scan, and we need that information um, back from those community-based providers. I think, um, you know, health information exchanges offer a lot of promise to improve efficiencies there. And then Thank the other thing that I want to add is it is so important to involve them, and then we need to recognize who is the quarterback of that community. For example, if we Hispanics, the quarterback is, done, is not the nephrologist, the hepatologist. He usually is the primary doctor that maybe is the one that speaks Spanish. Then we have to involve not only the nephrologist or hepatologist, but actually we have to involve the PCP in our communication and the relation to make sure that we start there because they are the one that starts sending patients to whoever, when, to all the specialists or even for transplantation. Awesome. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and conclude this webinar. Uh, thanks again so much to Drs. Davis, Tabor, and Caicedo for an amazing presentation. Uh, thanks to the ASC Living Donor COP and the Transplant Pharmacy COP and the ASC Ideal Committee for putting this together. And thanks uh, for giving Dr. Patel and I the honor of, of, of moderating this webinar. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening and for the amazing questions and discussions that we had afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And just please remember to complete the evaluation survey um, and enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you so much to our panelists and all the attendees. Thank you for the opportunity.